uh, as well. We have uh, the founder and the president of Grow Small Biz California, which is uh, an affiliate of the National Tax Limitation Committee. And you've got a, an event coming up shortly. It's going to be at the Dante Club. It's the intersection of business and politics. Tell us a little, about, a little bit about that. Uh, it's going to be a great event. It's on October the 17th. It's in the evening. It starts at five, registration starts at 5 o'clock. Uh, we've got 12 um, multicultural chambers already registered for this event, and we still have a couple more possibly to add to that. Uh, the first part of the event will be an opportunity for the public at large and business owners and employees to come and meet the chambers and learn a little bit about the various activities that they are involved in, the community events that they sponsor, and how they support our businesses. Now, this, some of the, name some of the chambers that will be involved in that. Oh, Sacramento, I'm, I knew I'm you guessing. Were, I knew you were going to hit me with that. <laughs> Let's see, there's the Metro Chamber, uh, Citrus Heights Chamber, Orangevale Chamber. Um, and a half a dozen others. And a half a dozen <laughs> okay, others, yeah. yes. I, okay. <laughs> well, it should be an interesting event, and the food is going to be good. Oh, the food's going to be great. It's only 20 bucks. Uh, there'll be more food than you can uh, shake a stick at, some great um, dessert a great dessert buffet all right um, and uh, the way that you can register is you go to www.limittaxes.eventbrite.com and register okay great um, one of the uh, uh, problems with this particular week in history is that it is the it's not the 100th anniversary but it's the 105th anniversary of the signing by Woodrow Wilson, our worst president ever. <laughs> okay, no, of, no of, debate there. Of the of the uh, of the uh, income tax, the uh, first income tax in the United States. I should say f first post Civil War income tax. Uh, Civil War they had an income tax which was ruled unconstitutional. And was only done to uh, pay for the wounded Confederates. And uh, the uh, income tax, of course, was ruled unconstitutional. So they passed a constitutional amendment. The 16th Amendment, that was in, I think, February of uh, 19, uh, 1913. And then by uh, October of 1913, lo and behold, an income tax which had a princely rate of 1% or 2% for most people. Mm -hmm. If your income went up to an in inflation-adjusted income of about $11 million, it went up to the exorbitant sum of 7%. The that, wow. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny if you, if you actually look at um, our GDP and the uh, income tax rates for the past 50 years, um, the amount of revenue tax collected, no matter what president was in power, no matter what tax rate there was, uh, the percent to GDP is always hovered around 17%. That's interesting. But back in 1913, it was 3%. The federal government was taking in 3% of GDP. State and local government, maybe another 4%. So, you know, the, 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 well, it, the total it, government take was 7%. The reason why we, we've gotten, uh, the government is able to, to obtain more is actually really by growth, growing the economy by, by having lower taxes. Typically, uh, you're going to have, uh, if you have, you know, less taxes, you have a larger GDP. Well, the interesting thing to me is back in 1913, the unemployment rate was 3.9% or 4.9%. And it's about 5% right now. 39 was the the most recent, uh, uh, you know, all-time low in, in this in the current recovery. So unemployment rate essentially un, 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 unchanged over the last 105 years. Mm -hmm. The uh, streets were paved. The the uh, cities had functioning sewers and water supply. There were inner-city rails. It was uh, we we had the the largest manufacturing company or uh, economy in the world. We we were the we had more manufacturing output than any other country in the world. Now we're second to China. Uh, the per capita income was uh, was was higher than all uh, than every other country in the world. Now we are I think seventh in per capita income. We we trail Qatar. We trail Switzerland, Ireland, Iceland of all places, and, and the three or four other countries. So. The income tax has not produced a nirvana of prosperity. Is that surprising to anybody? No. And, no, it's just and not, the numbers prove it. No, it's not surprising to me. But you know, when the income tax first came into being, um, we weren't we weren't generating revenues to solve every single problem in our society. Well, the other thing that happened when the income tax came into being was 
it was sold as a replacement for a tariff reduction. Tariffs were reduced from about 40% down to about 25%. Now we've got uh, income taxes that start at, what, 10%, go up to, what, is 27% or something like that, or more? Maybe, it's, I, I can't remember the, the, the top rate. That's outside of my income tax <laughs> level. But, but they're high, way higher, and we've got Trump increasing tariffs on top of it, going back up to, you know, 25, 35, 40% tariffs. What's wrong with this picture? Well, I mean, I think, I think, I think Trump is trying to eliminate tariffs. I mean, I think his If you listen goal, to his words, yes. Yeah, well, I mean, you can only do that, and then you have to, then you have to monitor the action that comes from those words. Yeah. So, I, you know, the, the tariff issue is, a, is another issue, but um, on, the, on the income tax part of it, it reminds me a little bit about the way Social Security came into play. If you remember when Social Security first started, there were 16, I think it was 16 or 18 people were paying in for every person that was drawing out. Yes. And now we're down to about three people. And going down. And going down, and it won't be much Thank longer. you very much, yeah. um, kids. I'm yeah. planning on living to be 150, <laughs> I believe, in the, uh, in the singularity. I remember a long time ago there was an article written on why the government should encourage smoking. <laughs> and it was uh, they really addressed that issue was that uh, the government should encourage us dying because the longer you live, the less the more the more you the more you draw down. Yeah. Yeah. Well. So, so we so yeah. I mean, and, and the other thing about I mean now government spends about uh, it, it, it taxes about twenty five percent of GDP spends about forty two percent of GDP, which means there's about fifteen percent of GDP that's being borrowed. Uh, at uh, now low yeah. rates of well, interest, well, the, but the, going up. Yeah, it the, just went, you know, 10 year rate just went up over 3%. Well, when it goes to, it comes to the taxes, it's not really about the revenues. We've, we've got plenty of revenues. It's really about the spending. And if we could get the spending under control, then we'd, we'd have a shot at it. But okay, let me, the let me, more we, the more revenue that comes in, they just find a way to spend it. There's never you well, there's I think any, think all, any spending. Cuts. All the income tax uh, goes to the debt. It doesn't actually go towards any like public services or anything. Well, like actually, that. actually, if you take a look at the actual numbers, you mentioned Social Security. The income tax or the inco all taxes, income tax, excise taxes, tariffs, uh, the whole the whole shebang pays for about two thirds of federal government spending, roughly two thirds, 69 percent. And that's how much is spent in Social Security, Medicare, interest on the debt. That takes up two thirds of federal spending. And those are what are called, what do they call those? The uh, uh, spending that's out of control, or the, you can't, it's uh, the, uh, I'll think of the word in a minute, but anyway, it's, it's unadjustable. It's, it's automatic year by year. It's not, it's not Cost changed. Of living. It's not, yeah, it's not changed. Uh, it's not part of the budgeting process. It's just automatic. Uh, and then the other uh, third of the budget is roads and the military, defense, uh, spy agencies, all, you know, all of the letter agencies in, in Washington, D.C. That only takes up about a third of the business, but we're borrowing 100% of the money that we're spending on what we consider to be uh, government functions uh, other than you know, income uh, transfer programs like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and, now and interest. And now what happens when, you know, right now our deficit is going up. Trillion dollars a year. It's, go, it's going, it's completely out of control. And we have interest rates at relatively low levels. Rock bottom levels. What, what happens if interest rates went back to historic averages? What would the percentage of the debt and interest be you get to a point. You get to a point where I mean, it's been a republic. Uh, you know, as Venezuela, Zimbabwe, uh, kind of kind of economics is what you end up getting to, where you, where you, you can't print enough money to pay to pay the interest, much less all the, you know all, all of the all of the transfer programs. So the the politicians don't seem to be concerned that that's going to happen. Uh, it's called kicking. The, it's called kicking the can. Kicking the can yeah. down the road. Yeah. Uh, but we have good news on the on the uh, trade front. On the trade front, NAFTA, that nasty trade uh, North American Free Trade Organization, that uh, that Trump campaigned against. It's the worst deal that we've ever negotiated. It's terrible. It's awful. It's been replaced now by the USMCA, United States Me Mexico 
Canada trade deal. Kind of sounds like the anything? YMCA. Yeah, right. That, that YMCA or, that's or, kind of what I thought it was right there. So yeah. the United States Marine Corps. <laughs> I thought about okay. the YMCA song, and I'm thinking maybe Trump could Is come there up with a it. dime's <laughs> worth of difference between NAFTA and USMCA? Well, Anybody. I, does that have a song with it? A catchy song? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know because I, I haven't studied it. Have you studied it? A little bit. Okay. When I, when so, I, when I looked at it, it, it kind of did. Uh, look uh, this, the same. I mean, it, it, I couldn't uh, highlight differences, but I did. it does appeal or it does seem more appealing. I feel that there will be some changes, but I just couldn't identify any. The only changes. substantive change that, that's better is that we have a marginal increase in the amount of dairy products that we can export to Canada. Yes. So dairy products, you know, if you, if you do cheese or butter or milk, you can do a little bit more exporting to Canada than you could before. Are you in the cheese or butter <laughs> or milk business? Uh, no, I didn't think so. Okay, that's part of it. That's, that's one good thing. The other good thing, maybe, is that, well, arguably, is, is being promoted as a good thing, but I would beg to differ, is that cars have to be 75% sourced in the United States as opposed to 62% sourced in the United States. And the minimum wage or the minimum wage for auto workers has to be sixteen dollars per hour for the US sourced part. So bottom line is cars are going to get more expensive because more of them have to be more a bigger portion yeah, of the Yeah, but nobody's car. gonna be driving cars anymore because um, we're gonna build the high speed rail and we've got these uh, uh, cars that you don't even have to have drivers for. <laughs> the high speed rail. So so we're, build you know, we're not gonna be car. we're not gonna be using our cars anymore. Okay. Well, anyway, I, I call it uh, new name, same old deal. Uh, I'm, you know, okay, well, I've got I've got a comment about I've got a comment about this, okay. and I, I mean, I think I think there's room for some criticism, but I think I think Donald Trump's game plan here was to try to improve the NAFTA deal first. Tell the Canadians, you know, if you don't want to play ball, that's okay because. We're going to make it miserable on you if you don't. And at the last hour, Canada came to the table. Now, maybe maybe the deal wasn't all that different than it was before. But the stock market seems to be um, accepting those two deals in a, in a positive way. Went down big time yesterday. Well, it had just hit a new all-time high. Okay. So you're going to have you know backing and filling in the stock market one day doesn't really make it, but if you look at the trend, the investors seem to be saying- It's a relief rally we, because we, we, we didn't you know, totally screw the pooch right. with, with trade. But, but that really isn't the game. It's really a sideshow. The real game is China. And there, Trump put pressure on China by making a deal with Mexico and making a deal with Canada. Now they're seen as working together to try to make the, the, the situation better. And now that's going to put a lot more pressure on China because that's, really that's really where the problem lies. Do you lies. really think that bullying a society, a culture that, is, uh, that puts a very high value on saving face, do you think a bullying tactic is going to work? No, I don't think. I don't think so. No, I don't think. Jack Ma, Jack Ma, the head of but, Alibaba, yeah, said, yeah. and I quote, he said, "It's going to be a 30-year trade war." Okay, China well, is already building the uh, the uh, the new Silk Road, which mm -hmm. is a multiple a multiple uh, travel corridor across, you already... across Asia and Europe. They're building a trade block that will be that will dwarf the size of the United States because they will combine China. Russia and Europe all in one trade block. I think that the uh, sputtering that we're doing on trade, the bullying that we're doing on trade is the last gasp of a dying empire. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Ch China is, is playing pr pr pretty uh, hard ball right now. So I don't know if you guys re read about it earlier, but uh, they it was, came out actually that they've been able to access all of our CIA and NSA da data by building a uh, microscopic chip on all of our circuit boards. And I work in the tech industry. I work, I work for a CPU manufacturing company uh, to do technical marketing. And that was actually a big concern to us because we go to a lot of companies like Foxconn, which is Chinese-based companies. which That's Foxconn. a Taiwan-based company. Well, and other countries over and near that area. And China has influence on all the companies all in that area. Um, and so they're using their private businesses to forcibly put, you know, 
their spyware on our on chips and everything. And so all of our motherboards, all the motherboards that are in the CIA right now, are all bugged. By China. Yes, they are all bugged. Because and are you so, serious? Yes, it, the, I just read the headline today. Uh, and so right now they're rapidly trying to take out all the servers because and they're finding this little tiny chip. It, it's it's so it, it's I don't know what type of data it could transfer, but it, it's you know fits right on top of your thumb. It's a tiny little mic little chip that sits right there and is able to and it just bugs their entire server. So right now, uh, our government has been bugged and they've been using private businesses to secretly get in there because no one would suspect the wiser. And it's even affected private businesses. So even Apple uh, has paying the consequences. Intel's paying the consequences. A lot of major corporations here that are, that are having to respond. And what are you? Because China has all of our manufacturing. And it's not so much that they're, they're cheaper. That's not why we go over there to manufacture. We go there because of the skill set. Um, and in fact, China is actually not even that cheap at all for manufacturing. They're, they're relatively close to the wages that we pay Americans. But they have a larger skill set. They have a large population. They're able to f force uh, specialized tooling over there. And they have that skill set. And they set. send all of their uh, best and brightest to our, our uh, Ivy League schools to learn to, to do uh, tech. Exactly. So, so they have a lot of skill set. And they're using their skill set against us. And, and so now we are at a point where what do we do? Our, China can, can very well become our enemy. They, and they're able to have... They're able to spy on us. They're, they're going to be the next uh, superpower. I, th I think when you say the, the collapse of an empire, that's going to be the new empire is China. If they can do it. Well, their their economy has been in, you know, is almost going into free fall. So in spite of all this that they're doing, their economy is in terrible, terrible condition. They've got cities that have been built that are almost... Well, and, and, and you know, and you know, part of the reason, you know, you know that's that, that's yes and no on that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it, a, it's it, a command economy, and they've done an awful lot of infrastructure building that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. But I was in China last fall, and uh, I, you know, I was in Beijing, I was in uh, Tibet, I was uh, at points in between, and it's not as bad as it's being made out to be in the American press. It's a very strong consumer-based economy that they're developing, and yeah, they've got some they've got some problems because they use you know for the because of the predilection for central planning, but they've got a very vibrant and strong private sector as well. Yeah, I, they I agree. do capitalism probably better than we do anymore. I, I think the thing is the difference is that they are, have more of a synthetic form of capitalism, but they realize while the Communist Party is maybe the controlling party there. They realize that capitalism is the way to have a successful economy. There's no way around it, and so they're trying their best to uh, create a synthetic capitalist uh, economy. So that's why they have all these cities that pop up, and then collapse because maybe capitalism wasn't able to start off as quickly as they thought it would. So that would collapse. But most of the time, uh, they do have really successful, uh, you know, economy by by having these capitalist areas. Well, I know they've been stealing our intellectual properties for years and years. Oh yeah, and very effectively. Business, very our effective. businesses go over there, and, and they have to sign. Oh yeah, yeah, they have to sign up to giving them all of their, you know. And we let them do secrets. that. We we let them do that to us. Yeah. Or our companies let them. And let I them still do don't that. understand why we do that. Well, why would a why would a uh, an American tech company? You can speak to this. Why would an American tech company uh, agree to giving up tech in order to get into the largest market in the world? Why why in the world would they do that? Because you got to have well, I mean, you're you're not giving up tech. I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, so the company I worked for um, for a while was issue or was when they first started back in the '70s was concerned about the government coming in there with antitrust laws. So what they did is they developed two processors. And I won't say which companies uh, I'm talking about, but I, they developed two processors, two different designs. They only copyright protected one of the designs. And they fired the lead engineer on the other design and gave him his design. And a few short months later, their biggest competitor uh, got was started. But that was intentional. Why? Because then you don't have to worry about antitrust laws coming in, involved in regulating the business. So now there's no regulation on CPU manufacturing because for a while they controlled and made their own competitor. And for they, what they used to do was once a design was ex would expire after about uh, a year or so, they'd have sell the product for about a year or two about three years after the design, they'll actually go to their competitor and give them the old design and say, go ahead and make this better. For the while, they only controlled less than 10% of the market. And it wasn't until a uh, computing uh, fall that happened back, uh, I believe in the 90s, that um, another OEM manufacturer decided to switch 
CPU companies, and that gave them a slightly bigger edge, and it became a legitimate competitor versus just a synthetic competitor. But for the while, they, they actually created their competition just to avoid the government regulation. Interesting. News to me. <laughs> well, and, and yeah. I'm leaving names out of this because I'm not really supposed to. Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> okay. It's more about uh, getting 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 down to uh, real world. Well, I say real world to swamp politics, and, I, and this is the swamp at its worst. I'm talking, of course, about the uh, the Kavanaugh nomination hearing circus. Tell us a little <laughs> bit about well. what's going on there, Tyler. Well, or Jack, <laughs> both of go, you. Go ahead, then I'll I'll chime in. Well. Um, I think everybody kind of, I, I didn't, I actually, for the while, didn't want to even know what was going on. <laughs> I, I, as soon as I saw that uh, a few weeks ago, I, I was like, oh, well, this will go die down in, in a few short days. And, and it kept popping up in my news feed. It's all over the news and stuff. I'm like, please go away. Please go away. And, and so it, it's kind of hard to not know anything about it just because, like, it's been, you know, shoved down our throats. But um, the ultimate decision is, it, I think that, you know, Ford has really just become, uh, her opinion was discredited. However, there is some people talking about how they wanted to say they want to put her in jail for making these accusations. Uh, Ford. So people were trying to uh, promote that, but I feel that that's equally uh, disingenuous as, you know, not believing uh, uh, Kavanaugh. It's interesting to me. Uh, I mean, the, the, the game of the Democrats from the get-go has been delay until 2020. It's the same game that the Republicans mm -hmm. played with uh, with Merrick Garland, uh, when uh, you know before before the uh, 2016 election. Yeah. Delay until we can make the make the nomination. So, you know, delay is the game for the Democrats. Would you agree with that? I, I would totally agree, and, and and I think they have overplayed their hand with the Kavanaugh thing, and I think they're waking up the sleeping giant. The the process that we've gone through watching this whole thing, you know, with going all the way back to July when Feinstein got, supposedly got the letter and she could have brought it to the Senate. She could have said, I've got something here that might be a problem. We need to check, check it out. But she didn't. When she had a chance to interview Kavanaugh personally, she didn't bring it up. So there was a plan there that they executed I, I, think to, was, I think it was a, a last-ditch uh, you know, It was the last, last But ditch here's, effort, a, here's but the thing. Here's the thing. I mean, I thought that uh, Ford, her, her testimony, I thought it was credible. I think probably something did happen to her, and I, I suspect that it may, it may have been at, uh, you know, at Kavanaugh's hand. But, I, you know, I was against the Kavanaugh nomination before all of this yeah, I agree. I stuff mean, came up. That really guy has a terrible Fourth record <laughs> on the Fourth Amendment. This is a guy who is in favor of subjecting American citizens to, to uh, torture and, and, and forced interrogation if they happen to have uh, originally come from Somalia. There was a Somali well, can, citizen. Can we torture and interrogate him? <laughs> no, there was a Somali, a Somali immigrant, a naturalized American, who was uh, picked up by an intelligence service in Kenya or someplace and subjected to unspeakable uh, interrogation techniques and uh, threats and so forth and so on without due process of law. His case was taken up by the ACLU, and good for the ACLU in this particular case. And it was Judge Kavanaugh who agreed with Judge uh, Janice Roberts Brown, concurred with her opinion, that said, you know what? This is about terrorism, so we're just going to ignore the Fourth Amendment. We're going to ignore due process. That's scary as hell. We don't need a Supreme Court justice that ignores the Fourth Amendment any exactly. more than we need somebody that ignores the Second Amendment or the First Amendment or the Fifth. Well, Richard, you know what's really interesting? This is the first I've even heard. Of it has not issue. been covered. It has okay. not been covered in the, so, in the mainstream so press. So this is, this is a, really a process problem. Oh, absolutely. You know, we're, we're not really judging, we're not really going through a process of trying to understand and evaluate a judge based on his opinions. Here's some opinions you are not pleased with. Why aren't those discussions taking place? Why, why aren't are we, they taking place? Why aren't I'll, they I'll, taking I'll tell you place? why they're not taking place, because the Republicans don't want to bring them up. Because well, why wouldn't the, why they, wouldn't they, the they, Democrats they, be bringing them well, up? Well, they, they did, but not very strongly. I think it's the same case that happened when uh, because they're in, in, in favor of the of the, uh, the you know the defense uh, military industrial complex just as, almost as much as the Republicans. That's why the, the, the Democrats. That's well, true, but I, I truly think it's because uh, 
the rape case is, is a lot more you're a lot easier to sell than than a concern over legitimate concern over the Fourth Amendment. I think more yeah. Americans are going to pay attention to sex cells uh, imprisoning terrorists doesn't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean that, that same thing happened when they were or trying to impeach terrorists. Yeah, because well, it wasn't. really it really fit really well into the in the Me Too movement yeah. in the Harvey Weinstein. Yeah, when we were trying to impeach Cosby uh, Clinton, and all that. That's the same thing happened. But the sad thing about all of this is while this dog and pony show is going on, and that's all it is, is a dog and pony show, the Senate and the House have passed a series of disastrous, disastrous federal spending increases. I mean, we're talking about trillion dollar budgets already. They're talking about putting together not an omnibus because that would attract attention. They are not putting together, and they, I swear to God, they call them a minibus. Minibus. Bills. You've got to be kidding. I am not. I, I swear. That's exactly what they're calling them. The minibus. A series of minibus bills where they put together a couple of programs that will please the Republicans, uh, tie them with programs that will please the Democrats, and pass it. Like defense is tied with, uh, you know, uh, social spending, or, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, it, it, you know, it's 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 absolutely it sounds, like, it sounds good, like a good idea. It at sounds first, like but the good old boys club is alive and doing well. The swamp is flowing freely. It certainly is. And that's the problem with all of this disastrous federal spending increase as well. We're being tra attracted by the he said, she said uh, debates or hearings in Washington. Well, I mean, you probably is there any wonder you, you probably won't find too many people that actually even heard about the NAFTA and the Can Canadian deal being done. I, I know you're not really fond of it, but most Americans don't even know that, that those also two got deals, well, yeah, those true. deals got done. Is there any, is there, I mean, all of this is going on. It's, dog, it's, it's uh, bread and circuses while dirty deals are being done. Would the fact that 36% of Americans can't pass a citizenship test have something to do with that, do you think? <laughs> They don't even know how to spell civics. <laughs> that's, that, that's the part that's really interesting. In fact, the statistics that you had in your article I thought were fascinating. You only have to pass 60, you only have to get 60% of the answers correct in order to pass the test. And 36 can't. And 36 Percent can't, can't do it. Yeah. That is incredible. You're going to be doing some civics uh, Instruction at the yes. Dante Club coming up. Yeah. Right. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that come to in the about 10 seconds. Come to the Dante Club. Go to limit www.limittaxes.eventbrite.com. October 17th, Dan Walters will be there. He'll be talking about the intersection of business and politics. We look forward to being there. I'll be there. You be there too. Thanks very much for being part of the Libertarian Counterpoint.